Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the latest of our GA Coach webinar series. Uh, thanks to everyone for registering and taking the time to come on the call this evening. Tonight we have Shane Keegan as our presenter. Um, Shane is a sports coach and a freelance journalist. Um, he's former manager of both Wexford Youths and Galway United in the SSE Electricity League and a student of coaching, having studied coaches across several sports. Um, and he's heavily involved in, in a broad range of Gaelic games codes uh, with, with various different teams across different levels. Along the way, Shane has attained the UEFA Pro Licence and a Master's in Sports Co in Coaching Science from UCD. Tonight's presentation from Shane uh, will be built upon the one he delivered at the Games Development Conference earlier this year. And the topic title is Empowering Your Players Lesson Learned from Top Managers. So Shane, I'll hand it over to you and you can work away. Well on, cheers Peter. Um, firstly, thanks very much for, for everybody who's who's tuned in. Appreciate you giving up a, a, a Thursday evening. A um, couple of things, I suppose, before I dive into it. Um, first to be that, I, obviously, like yourselves, I've been keeping an eye on, on the, uh, the webinars over the last couple of weeks. They've been absolutely fantastic and fair play to the lads for all the effort that's been put into them. Um, Stuart Lancaster, obviously, last Thursday night was phenomenal and uh, I'm certainly no Stuart Lancaster either in terms of, of achievement or presentation skills so uh, I'd be a poor comparison with him but however um, in addition to that I suppose I'd say look there might be one or two technical errors knowing me as we go along bear with me if anything does happen as we as we go along as I say um, and yeah look as Peter said vast majority of this was is in line with what I presented um, at the GA coaching conference earlier this year so if you have already uh, seen it, uh, apologies if, if a lot of it is doubling up. I've tried to throw in a, a, a decent bit of new stuff, particularly towards the end when it comes to the um, continuous learning areas and areas where we can pick stuff up going forward. So uh, look, I'll dive in away and uh, I think there's a question section at the end if anybody has anything as, we, as we're moving along anyway. So look, um, I suppose just firstly to list out the three aims from the presentation so we can see where we're trying to get to. Um, first one is I'm going to explain why I believe it's so important to look for learning from outside of your own sport. Um, again, I, I suppose preaching to the converted a little bit here and that you've, you've come on to, to listen to a soccer man talk about coaching. Um, so you're probably on, on the right side of that line already. But look, we'll, we'll just talk about it a small bit anyway. Um, the main body of the presentation is where we're going to look at three football managers um, that I've, I suppose, studied an awful, awful lot over the last few years um, and see what learnings we can take from them that are applicable across various different sports, basically. And the third part of it is where we're going to highlight some of the avenues available for continuous learning outside of those provided by the GEA. Um, look, there's so much out there, there really, really is. And I suppose you'll probably be already aware of, of the vast majority of what I uh, of what I throw up. But there, look, if there's one podcast or if there's one you know, piece of reading material or something that you come across that 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 you haven't seen before, and well, then maybe that might be worthwhile. Um, so first part of it, why learn from other sports? So for me, this is 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 absolutely massive. I, I really, honestly, do believe that anybody who's confining their learning to within their own sport is just it's it's a crazy, crazy situation to be. You're you're missing out on so so much. You really, really are. Um, and a couple of points I'd throw up, I, I suppose, around it. Um, most of the key skills of coaching and management, if you look at, look at them, they're 100% transferable across sports. They really, really are. The first one I've turned up there is, is communication styles. Now, hopefully we don't go too mad here, but I'll, uh, I'll try and come out of this just to show you what I mean. I mean, I would be a big fan of, of, of basketball. Um, look, it's not my sport. It's not your sport, but, but have a quick look at this clip and... I mean, if, if we're not able to pick up something in terms of communication from this guy, Steve Kerr, um, who's right at the top of his profession, I don't think we, we have any hope, really. Uh, it's a one minute clip. I'll just let it play through. He's talking to a guy who is not only the star player on his own side, but one of the star players in the NBA um, over the last few years, a guy called Steph Curry. And I just think that, that the communication between the two is, is, is absolutely superb. Uh, do... We'll eventually hit play on it. Can you hear the volume there, Peter? No, no sound. Hmm. 
No. I might come out of full screen and see if it'll work any better for us. That coming on to you, Peter, no? No, uh, no, no sound still, Shane. Okay, we'll jump if, back. If you, want to, if you want to jump it, we can share the video clip with everybody. Um, I, I can put the URL into the chat function here for, for everyone to have a look at later on. No problem at all. Spot on, we can do that. Uh, we'll jump back out. Okay, we can listen to that live, lads. Definitely, definitely, if Peter can send it out to you, worth coming back and listening to that. The way the man communicates is, is absolutely superb. He, uh, now he's decided to start. No, there's no sound coming through, Shane. Sorry. My end, I thought you were in years. No problem. Look, we'll plow on from there. Um, the second one I've got up there is dealing with adversity. I suppose the example that I gave, it's something that we all go through very, very much. So, I mean, it's almost impossible to have any sort of coaching career in sport without coming through across very, very hard times. Hearing other coaches, again, outside of your own sport, talking about that is... is, is a, massively massively helpful i mean i suppose the person i check back to is is i listened to derek mcgrath on on an off the ball podcast one day talking about the i suppose the the tough times that he went through when maybe his his tenure at, at water was being questioned and how it became a challenge even to go down to the local supermarket just to to pick stuff up and and trying to hide away from people because he didn't want to have to have that conversation and you know i was going through probably something a little bit similar at the time and, and i thought it was fantastic right he mightn't be in the same sport as me, but at the same time, it was a huge learning experience from me being able to hear for me being able to hear another guy talking like that. Um, session planning again, go and watch sessions outside your own sport. People will set things up differently. You know, the timing might be different, the communication lines and all that might be different. You'll take something from it. You'll you'll absolutely you'll take something from it. Um, I suppose what I'd say on it is, if you think about it. You set up a session and you run a session in, in a manner that you're used to, in a manner that you've seen done before, which is very applicable to your sport. If you go away from that, if you go to another sport, they will do things. I'm not saying they do things better than how you do it in your sport. All I'm saying is they'll do things differently than how you do it in your sport. And different is good. Different is, is really good because it gets you thinking about things in a, in a manner different than what you might ever have done before. Um, and you might think, Jesus, yeah, that works there for him. I wonder, would that work in my sport? Would I be able to do that a little bit differently? Bring it back, give it a try. Sometimes it might fall in its arse. It might work for you. But sometimes it might it might pay off brilliantly. So it, it's really, really worthwhile um, trying to broaden your scope in terms of, 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 of watching other sessions from that point of view, in, in my eyes anyway. Um, and the last one I've got there is, is performance analysis. So I'm gone into a new role with, with Dundalk Soccer Club at the moment where I'm the opposition analyst for them. Um, something I was really enjoying, obviously, until, until the coronavirus hit. But in terms of how I go about doing that role, gathering my information, um, how I go about presenting the information to the players, the formats, the technology used and all that, I have taken all of that almost 100% from the GEA Performance Analysis Seminar that I go to in Carlo IT every year. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic event and, and I'm stealing ideas from how Sean O'Donnell does it with Limerick. You know, I'm stealing ideas with, you know, what Damien Young might be doing with Tip or what Davy Morris might have been doing with Galway. And I'm taking that and I'm applying it to what we're doing at Dundalk. And it, it's working absolutely brilliantly for me, working absolutely brilliantly for me. So, again, you know, go outside your own code in, in terms of that side of things as well. Um, the different approaches to best practice that sports take may, may present you with fresh new ideas. So that's kind of coming back on, on the session plan and one um, a bit so it is. It's, it's just we're all very, very narrow. There is a sense of monkey see, monkey do. And I think taking yourself out of your own sport for those kind of ideas, it's, it's just it, it, it's hugely, hugely beneficial. The last one, if you think about it, makes a hell of a lot of sense. And it's, it's probably the best reason to go outside your own sport is... We were actually just chat, chatting off camera before it started, myself and, and, and Peter, about how I find it hard maybe sometimes to get the learning that I want to get from other soccer coaches. 
he was saying at times it's hard sometimes maybe to get a, a, a GEA coach to do something that he's looking for them to do maybe at times. It makes sense, though. To a certain extent, we do all have to be a little bit guarded against our competitors. We don't want to be giving away our, our, our complete trade secrets to our competitors. Um, so I suppose the example I used was was if Paul Canark rocks up to, to Eamon O'Shea's training session uh, or Dar Egan's training session at Tipperary and asks if he can come in and watch their sessions for a few weeks, you can you can pretty much imagine the answer that uh, that he's likely to get. Whereas if he heads up to, to Dublin and, and approaches Bohemians and approaches one of the best soccer coaches around Trevor Crawley to see if, if he can watch what Trevor is doing for a couple of sessions, I'm sure Trevor will have no problem with it. If he goes into Stuart Lancaster and asks, can he observe what, what Leinster are doing? Again, I'm sure there'll be no issue there whatsoever or, or Dave Passmore with Irish hockey. You know, going outside your own sport, there's definitely an awful lot more scope for it. An awful, awful lot more scope for it. Another tip on that is, by the way, if you're seen as not being a, a, a superpower, for want of a better way of putting it, um, in a particular code, and you're going to learn from the best in that code, they also don't see you as a big threat, and they're very, very willing to share. So if you're from a lesser hurling county, you'll find that your, your tips and your Galways are probably more inclined to, to let you in and give you access than if you're from one of the stronger counties, if that makes sense. Um, which again is is fair enough, really. So it is. Um, look, moving on to the main body of the presentation, I suppose creating a culture um, is the way I phrased it. Uh, again, I, I kind of always preempt the word culture is 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 one that maybe has a little bit of a bad rep, um, being so flowery and kind of thrown out by anybody who wants to seem like they have half a brain when it comes to this coaching crack. But Peter himself kind of phrased it very very well to me when I sat down with him initially about all this. He described culture as your beliefs, you know, your what beliefs do you place at the top? Which are the ones that have the most importance to you? And OK, now do your behaviours as a person, as a coach, do your behaviours as a coaching team, as a management team, and do your behaviours as players reflect that those beliefs, which therefore reflects that or creates that culture? And I, I just thought that was a good way of, of broadening it out and it helped me kind of structure what I was trying to present from there. Um, but sorry, I suppose that for those who don't know, I'm pretty sure most of us should know, the three coaches that we're, we're looking at um, are three that are abs absolutely at the top of the game, in my opinion. Jurgen Klopp, uh, Pep Guardiola, and our own new Irish international manager, Stephen Kenny. Um, Klopp and Pep, uh, what I've learned from them, I've learned from looking at them from a distance. Um, I will say that I would do more than look at them. I think you've, you've got to read about these guys voraciously, take as much as you can on board from them. Read with a highlighter, read with a notepad and a pen beside you, read with a laptop that you can start typing in a few notes. I mean, to me, there's a difference between observing somebody and trying to learn from somebody. You know, if you're observing, you're just looking and you're going, yeah, isn't that great? If you're learning, you, 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 how can you learn without taking notes? I can't. I suppose there's different people with different learning styles. I can't. I need to be taking notes all the time. Um, and that's what I've done with those two in terms of, of even when you're watching their, their their matches on TV, I'd have the tactics for kind of the geek that I am out beside me and you'd be lining out formations and seeing, right, where are they strong, where are they weak, how are they going to take advantage of their strong areas, how are they going to try and compensate for their weak areas, all of that kind of thing. Stephen, thankfully, I've, I've got to know a little bit better than that. I've been able to, to, to look at a bit more closely over the years. He's an absolute gentleman and has been very, very good with his time. So, look, we'll, we'll go through um, things that, are, that kind of I found were universal across the three guys. Um, four common themes that emerge from them. So the first one is togetherness. I'll dig into these a bit more deeply, obviously, as we go into them. The second one is psychological safety, which is a term I'll, I'll explain for those who haven't come across it before. Third one is confidence. And the fourth one is demanding environment. Um, and as I say, these really, really did prove to be very, very common across all three of the coaches. So the first one, togetherness. First one I'm going to throw up, all these comments are either by the managers themselves or by players talking about them. So the first one is by Liverpool's assistant manager, Pep Linders. So he says, Jürgen creates a family. We always say 30% tactic, 70% team building. Now, when I read that, I found that amazing because I don't think there's too many of us that would have the percentages that way around. Um, I think most of us would flip the percentages and arguably even go higher than 70% on the tactic side of things. But... Here's their assistant manager explaining to us that this is the amount of emphasis that Jurgen Klopp put, puts on the importance of team building. Um, 
Now, what I would say is I have found probably that I, I do think within GEA circles and amongst GEA coaches, they probably are maybe a bit more focused on the team building side of things than maybe we are as as as, as soccer managers to a certain extent. Um, I brought in um, Jason Ryan with me when I was at Wexford Youths. Um, I was down in Wexford. Jason had been you know had been over the Wexford Gaelic footballers down there previously, and I heard an awful lot of good things about him. And uh, I brought him in a role in a role that was I suppose was essentially he was a strength and conditioning coach for us. But but I asked him to kind of you know, use his expertise in, in whatever ways he could in, within the setup to help us improve. Um, and he was very strong on that. He was very, very strong on the idea of team building and, and bonding and trying to create all that. And I suppose you look at Liverpool, what they're doing probably costs millions to replicate the kind of bonding things they're going off on, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But Jason stripped it way back, did some really, really great things with us, some mad stuff, but it, it, it really did work. Like he, he set up all these kind of challenges, you know, I remember one where all the players were in a hall on, on, on this particular occasion. There was obstacles set up all over the hall and they were split into teams of, I think it was five, and four fellas had a, a blindfold on them while, while one guy was the, the leader and he had to communicate to them and try and guide them all around the, uh, the obstacle course without uh, touching them, just purely using communication. And look, there's lads clattering into each other and falling over this and falling over that, but it was great. Great crack knocked out of it. Really, really great crack knocked out of it. And it definitely served its purpose. And like he, had, he had more exercises, crazy stuff going on. There was who could build the highest structure from pieces of spaghetti and, and, and marshmallow and all this kind of crack. And, you know, as soon as he announces it, go, off you go. And you, you, you're, you're, I suppose your leaders start to emerge and you start to see different communication styles and you start to see how people gel and Mad stuff like that, um, to me, works. You don't have to have the millions that the likes of a Liverpool spend on, on trying to create togetherness. Um, second one is from Pep Guardiola himself. We're here to help each other so that players don't feel tension and division. We are one. We are not little groups because in all teams, this is what ends up killing team spirit. Um, and I suppose the example on that one with, with Pep is Pep has a guy that he brings everywhere with him in his management team. He's... Again, you talk about pe taking people from other sports. He's actually, I think he's like classed as one of the greatest water polo people ever. But uh, he's, he's somehow himself and Pep got to know each other very well. And he, he follows Pep everywhere Pep goes. Um, and Pep gives him all kinds of jobs and all kinds of different stuff to do. But on this particular occasion, he asked him when he was at Barcelona, he said, when we score, during a game when we score, I want you to look at the bench. And tonight when we're alone, I want you to tell me what the reaction of those people on the bench was. Because some of them are going to celebrate like they've scored the goal themselves. And they're, they're going to be euphoric. And some of them are going to celebrate, but I don't know, you'll know by their body language that it's probably not genuine that they're doing it for perception reasons. Um, and then some of them might react at all. They're, they're, they're so annoyed and they're so pissed off at not haven't started that they're just not going to, to celebrate at all so they're not and his whole thing was obviously he was wrapped up in the game he couldn't do that but by having somebody identify that he was now able to point out he was now able to judge the characteristics of the players that he had within his group and what he did was as quickly as he possibly could then he got rid of those ones that were identified as the bad eggs this was helped them judge who those were and quickly as he could soon as the transfer window came right how quickly can i get them out of that um, now, again, another point that he made on it, I suppose, which was, was very good to read because, uh, you know, I've got this wrong on a few occasions myself, is we can all get fooled by somebody. You know, we can all think that somebody is the right kind of person for our culture. Um, obviously, the, the one he got drastically wrong was Latin Ibrahimovic, who was, as I do describe him, the greatest May fanner there's ever been. And, and here's, yeah, here's Pep signing him. But you know, he put on this face, he put up this guard that, you know, no Pep, I am that kind of guy and the media has me wrong and I buy into all the things that you buy into. And, and Pep bought it and, and I bought it at times and you end up with, you know, a wrong one in your dressing room. And the thing is, how quickly can you identify that you have got it wrong and you have made errors and, and try and ship them back out again? And I suppose he, he managed to do that reasonably quick. But I just found that all very interesting in terms of, of, of creating togetherness. Um, the last one is Robbie Benson. He was a, a super player during, during um, Stephen's time at Dundalk. He said, I was a substitute for the first when I came into the club. But even then, he was telling me I was going to become a hugely important player for Dundalk. I never felt ignored. Now, togetherness, like the, the key ingredient in togetherness is 
those players who aren't starting. I mean, it's very, very easy for the, for the starting players to, to feel together, so it is. But how are you going to handle the ones that aren't in the starting lineup? How do you make them feel as if they're almost as important as, as anybody else who is in the setup? I mean, that's a huge, huge challenge. And I mean, here you have Robbie saying that that's, you know, that's a challenge that Stephen overcame. Stephen managed to do that. Um, and I suppose the best example I can think of it is from my own county. I mean, I would have spoken to numerous leash hurlers who would have spoke who would have worked under under Cheddar Plunkett when Cheddar was there and I mean it was phenomenal the way these guys spoke about Cheddar. Absolutely phenomenal. And I'm talking number twenty three, number twenty four, number twenty five on the panel, not not the star man. Um the respect that they had for him was was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you know, I keep saying if you go into my dressing room and you ask my players what they think of me, the starting eleven will say I'm a great fella and, and those who aren't in the starting eleven will call me every name under the sun, whereas that just was not the case with Cheddar. He seemed to have this balance absolutely perfected. Um and kind of, and and it's a huge challenge for all of us. It really, really is, but it's something to be mindful of, I suppose, is is the best way I can put it. Um psychological safety. So what is it? Psychological safety is empowering players to take chances without them fearing the repercussions of what will happen if something goes wrong. Um, now that again is easier said than done. It's it's a holy grail to a certain extent, so it is, and it's it's a huge, huge thing I think that coaches need to focus on because we all get so wrapped up in in wanting to win our matches that we don't realise we're placing the fear, putting the fear of God in players at times, um, and stopping them from expressing themselves. So just looking at the examples of it that are here. So Jurgen Klopp, the boys know that they can make mistakes. Football is a game of mistakes, but what is important is the reaction. You lose the ball, you try to win it back. You can see the goal, then you try and to go and score one. If we want our teams to be creative, then we cannot punish them for mistakes. Now, you know, I, I, at times I say it's very, very easy to say things. It's very, very different to try and walk the walk. Jurgen Klopp walks the walk, and we only need one example of it, and that's the Trent Alexander corner. Um, I mean, you go back to the Champions League final. I mean, here's a young, young boy standing over a corner while his team are behind, sorry, semi-final, I should say, obviously, while his team are behind, um, and he sees something, and he has it in him to go and try it. Like, think about it there. How Think about how much he was putting out himself out there. I mean, in, in so many setups, surely the guy standing over the ball there would have been terrified. If I make a ball to this, the manager is going to jump down my throat, the rest of my players are going to jump down my throat. That was not his thought process. And the reason it wasn't his thought process is because of this culture and the situation that Klopp has managed to create at that club. Um, I also found it interesting that Klopp went on to say that this psychological safety is, is not something that can be created over the course of a day or a week or a month. He says this has to be created over, over years. And he said it's hammered home in the Liverpool Academy. Absolutely hammered home. These boys have been taught at eight, nine do it, go on, try it, try it. And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Don't worry. And I just thought that was really, really important that because I mean, so many of us, I'm I'm I've got a five-year-old at home, I'm back coaching under sixes again at home, and so I am. I'm sure plenty of you are in the same boat. It's it's so important that we try and ingrain that in, in the kids as early as possible. I mean, if you're creating psychological safety within your group of 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 girls or or, or boys at, at eight, nine, ten, eleven. Imagine how creative and how confident in themselves they're going to be when they reach your senior manager at your club or at your county. I mean, they're going to be extremely thankful to you for, for, for the kind of person you're after producing. Um, the second one is, is Pep himself. I won't tell you off if you misplace a pass or miss a header that costs us a goal, as long as I know you're given 100%. I can forgive you any mistake, but I won't forgive you if you do not give your heart and soul to the team. The really important thing here is uh, Pep phrases this quite well because it's important we don't get mixed up. It's important that we realise psychological safety does not mean that everybody is mollycoddled and that there's absolutely no room for criticism at any time. But the important thing is to be able to distinguish between actions, I suppose, that are controllable and ones that aren't. I mean, if you play, if you play 100 passes in a game, well, chances are one of those passes is going to go astray. That one that goes astray may just be the one that actually results in your team conceding a goal. You didn't mean to make that mistake. So the manager or your players born and shouting and bollocking you out because of that mistake is the most pointless exercise of all time. It really, really is. 
but at the same time there's another scenario where if i'm if i'm if i see an opposition player running past me and heading into the box and i decide nah i don't think i'll bother tracking him sure somebody else will probably pick him up when i get there well now i absolutely deserve to feel the wrath of my manager and my players because that's a decision that's not an action that 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 just went wrong in you that's a de- that's a decision where you've made the wrong decision a lazy decision and likewise if there's a ball there to be challenged for and you decide oh i don't like the look of that one that looks you know i might come out worse for wear on the back of that one again you know jump all over him for that that's just a lack of courage that's you know i have no problem with with, with you getting on his case for that one or the third example I usually give is, is if a player is running through one on one with a goalkeeper and and he has a teammate alongside who we can square tap for an open goal, he decides to take the more difficult option um, and the keeper saves it. Again, get on him, get on his case here. That you know you can you can have a go at him over that without kind of that dismissing the idea of psychological safety. So it's important that we differentiate between you know the mistakes that are just going to happen. They're just going to happen. It's part and parcel of the game as opposed to poor decisions. Where, where a player has knowingly not made the right decision for us. Definitely get on his case there. Um, the last one I've got is from Stephen O'Donnell. He would have been Stephen Kenny's captain at Dundalk uh, for the majority of his time there, I suppose. There was always a plan, and you will always know your role inside out. But he also gives you the freedom to go and do your stuff. He trusts you to make your own decisions. So psychological safety, a huge, huge part of it is becoming a decision maker. Being given the psychological safety to make your own decisions. Yes, you've got a game plan and yes, you've got a, a structure that you're trying to stick to, but there has to be some shape or form or, or level of freedom within that. And I suppose I, I, I have to use myself as, as a worst case example of where that wasn't the case. Um, I, I would have had a very talented under 14 Kilkenny soccer team um, years ago when I was coming up along that, that Sean Maguire and, and Mikey Drennan, one or two other fellas, would have progressed out of. And uh, we went all the way to an All-Ireland final at, at, at under-14 level. We, we were fantastic. We were beaten narrowly in an All-Ireland final. And I remember the international trials for the age group Irish under-15s came up shortly after. And we, we sent about half a dozen players into it. Um, and to be quite honest, I, I expected them all to make it. I thought they'd all been brilliant that year. And I thought they'd all make the Irish squad easy enough. And word came back then that, that, that only one of them had made it. Um, I was really disappointed. So I was really disappointed. And... Thankfully, I had a good enough relationship with for, with the Irish manager at the time in that age group that I could give him a call and not to shout down the phone at her aunt, but just to ask what had gone wrong for the players, you know, why, how had they not impressed as much as I was hoping they had or hoping they would? And um, he gave me he gave me a serious lesson and one that that completely transformed my, my my way of thinking, certainly in terms of underage coaching. That's for sure. He said to me, look, he said, Shane, I've, I've watched those lads play for you all year and, you know, they've been a credit to you. You know, if you say jump, they jump. You know, if you say run this way, they'll run this way. You know, they stand exactly wherever where they're supposed to stand based on what you've told them all the time. But you've created a team of robots. And when they landed up here to, you know, in a scenario like this where, it's, where they're on trial and you're not there to stand on the sideline and tell them do this, do that, do the other, they had no ability to make decisions for themselves. Absolutely not. They were brilliant at, at, at carrying out orders, but they had no ability to make decisions for themselves. And, you know, I felt oh, criminally negligible, really, so I did. I, I thought I'd been doing all the right things, but, you know, it really hit home just how wrong I had got things when he phrased it that way. And, you know, again, it's just something for us all to be wary of. And obviously, as I say, with, with Stephen, he manages to get that balance perfect, so he does. Um, the next one I've got is is confidence. It's a huge, huge thing um, for us that we all need to focus on trying to make sure we're giving players confidence at all times. Stephen, in particular, is absolutely amazing at it. It's, it's arguably his strongest attribute. Just to go through them, um, this one is is Roberto Firmino talking about, um, or, or sorry, Jurgen Klopp talking about for Roberto Firmino. He was going through a bit of a rough patch and he says he was a bit concerned by his lack of goals, but I told him that he is the only player in the world who can play this position in the way that I need it done. Now, thing about confidence is a lot of us think we're good at, at giving players confidence, but we use generalizations. You know, we throw out phrases like, oh, you know, you're a great bit of stuff or, you know, geez, didn't you do really well? Or, you know, just generalizations. To really instill confidence in a player, it has to be more nuanced than that. It has to really, really hit home. So I like to play this one out in my head. I like to use imagery and try and actually think of it. Like, just imagine Roberto Firmino walking into Klopp's office there and, you know, he hasn't scored in a good few weeks and 
shoulders are dropped a little bit and the body language isn't, isn't wonderful and, you know, Gaffer, I'm, I'm not scoring, you know, what, what am I doing wrong kind of a thing. And the response isn't, ah, it's grand Bobby, you know, the goals will come or, you know, it's fine, it's fine, you'll, you'll be grand, don't worry about it, I, I, I believe in you. It's far more focused than that. Like, think of it, you are, you are the only player who can play this, the only player in the world who can play this position in the way that I need it done. And I'm sure he went on to give him, you know, you're doing this for me, you're doing that for me, and that has this effect on us, and that has this effect on us, and that's why we're winning games. And like, think about, you know, think about Firmino walking back out of that room. That's that's a completely and utterly different man. The man that's walking out of that room is a completely different man than the man that's walked into it. And look, you get the happy end, and then that very next game, Firmino goes and, and scores, and he runs a clock across and jumps on clock, and you know, we might not get the happy ending as quite as quickly as, as they got it there, but uh, you know, it was it was great to see it happening on the back of such good communication lines from Klopp. Um, second one is Guardiola. Pe look, let's be honest, Pep Guardiola isn't a man who I suppose has to instill massive confidence in his players because he, he tends to have some of the best players in the world in, in most of the dressing rooms he's been in. But I still found this interesting because we can change it and make it relatable to our own scenario. He said, in this dressing room, the players are the best, the very best. Look at each other. You must be so happy with what is looking back at you. And again, that's that's a super one to actually visualize and, and play out in your head. Like imagine being David Silva sitting in that dressing room. As he says that, David looks to his left, he sees Sergio Aguero, he looks to his right, he sees Kevin De Bruyne. I mean, I don't care who they're coming up against that day. You know, David Silva thinking to himself, yeah, we've got this. Like he's right, he's right, we've got this. And it mightn't be applicable to us that we, we might necessarily have the best players in our in, in, in the world in our dressing room all the time. But we could change that. That doesn't have to be the phrase that we use. We don't have to say that these players are the best. If we've created the right culture where everybody is willing to, to, to really, really go those extra yards for each other and we've really got that togetherness, we've really got psychological safety, we've really managed to nail everything else. I mean, you, ca you could well find yourself in a dressing room where you're able to say, in this dressing room, the players are the most committed. Look at those around you. Do you see guys who will go to the ends of the earth for you? It's very possible that you can say that with honesty, knowing that that sentence rings true. And imagine they're the last words coming out of your mouth before the start of a match and the players are looking at each other and going, yeah, he's right here. What he's saying is, is bang on. Um, so what, what can we say? How can we, how can we give those players that confidence? What way can we phrase it to give our players confidence? I suppose particularly in those, those final moments before they walk out onto the field. Um, Stephen, as I've said, is 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 absolutely sensational at this. Um, Chris Shields, uh, I suppose a, a water carrier, it's sometimes referred to in 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 football. The guy who kind of sits in front of the back four and you know does the simple thing. Chris says he would take me away for a one-on-one -on -one chat and go through what he expected of me, while also explaining why I was the perfect man for the job. Now. Chris is a guy who, as I say, doesn't really look to do the spectacular. He's not a guy who's going to go look to score you double figures over the course of a season, or he's not going to dance around players, or he's not even probably going to try and spray 60, 70-yard passes or anything, so he's not. What he does is he goes, puts in a tackle, wins the ball, and then a phrase he nearly used himself is give the ball then to the fancy dance and, and, and let them do the, 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 the fancy stuff from there. Now, some people would look on a player as that, uh, like that, as, as limited, having a limited skill set. But Stephen is flipping that completely. Stephen is explaining to him why having that skill set, that skill set that you've got, Chris, that you know you've got, that makes you the perfect man for the job that I require you to do today. And if Chris Shields looks in the mirror and thinks, right, what's needed from this role? Okay, there are the attributes needed to carry it out. Yeah, he's right. I am actually perfect. I am pretty good at all of those attributes. Yeah, I can see why this is, is, is an ideal role for me and I can see why he thinks that I'm, I'm the perfect man to play, to play it out for. So again, you know, really, really good stuff from, from Stephen in terms of, of, of that. Last one is demanding environment. Um, and again, a really, really tough thing to try and create. Um, first one I've got up there again is Klopp. I demand a lot of energy from my players. Therefore, I must be seen to possess that also. I see myself as being the extra tank of the players. When their energy starts to get less and less late in the game, that is when I must infuse them with my energy. Now, Klopp, as anybody knows, is certainly a larger than life character and you know he, he's mental to watch on the sideline, absolutely mental to watch. And he, he's on the go 24-7, so he is. Um, and, and 
so is his team. If you think about it, I mean, Liverpool, they're a fine, fine outfit, but particularly in that midfield area, it really is all about energy, 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 work rate, go, 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 go all the time. Now, if he's one of these managers who's sitting on the bench with the arms turned back and the body shape is kind of languid looking, very, very hard for his players to be doing what he's demanding of them on the pitch. Um, he is what he wants them to be. Um, he's all go and therefore they're all go. And then that bit about the extra tank when they start to get, get tired. I mean, have a look the next time. God knows when the next time we get to watch the soccer match is. But the next time you get to watch Jurgen Klopp, yeah, he will be animated from the start. But watch those last 15 minutes. I mean, he goes from third gear to fourth gear to fifth gear very, very quickly in those last 15 minutes in terms of his, his body language and the energy that he shows. It's phenomenal. And it, I, I had never understood before that it was it was an actual a, a tactic that he, he specifically does for a reason. And I understand it now. The players are starting to fade a little bit. OK, I need now to become even an even greater presence on the sideline for them. And by doing that, you can imagine them looking across, you know, they're shagged and they look across the next thing they see this lad and he's, oh my God, he's still going, he's lepping and he's jumping. And it probably does give them that extra little boost or it does book them up again a little bit. And, and they probably do find those bit of energy reserves a little bit more. But you can only demand it when you're delivering it. And he certainly delivers it in that respect. Um, the second one on Pep, um, talking about the training ground, every day you must come here and try to get better. Every single day. I can say that I will be very demanding of you all just like I will be of myself. Now, obviously, to say that Pep is eats, sleeps and breathes football is, is, is putting it mildly, OK? So because he is absolutely, completely wrapped up in it, he can place whatever demands he wants on his players. Whatever demands he wants on his players, because he's given it back to them tenfold. So they have nowhere to hide in terms of him asking them to go to the ends of the earth and back. And look, we're not all in that kind of environment where we can 24-7 be the fella, be the kind of person that Pep is. But there are plenty of things that we can do and should do and have to do to make sure that we're proving to our players that, OK, I'm going to make demands of you, but, but, but I'm going to set the standard way above and beyond myself first. And again, I suppose from personal experience, the example I would give is, you know, we in the League of Ireland, we play on a Friday night. Um, vast majority of teams play on a Friday night, but there are a couple that play on a Saturday. And... You know, you could have a game there on a Friday night and probably happened too many times for my liking where things don't go right for you on a Friday night. And, you know, you, you could have been bet 3 nil, let's say, on the Friday night game. And Saturday, you're in for a recovery session with the players and, you know, everybody's in bad old form and you're, you're walking around and you're trying to get spirits up and you're, you know, you're trying to shake it, you know, shake that horrible feeling out of fellas. And really all anybody wants to do is, is, is be away from the place and, and go home to their families and all that. But... You, on the other hand, are probably going to go away from that session. You're going to get a quick bite to eat. And then, in my scenario, Cove, uh, Sligo and Longford were the three teams that tended to play on a Saturday night. It was into the car and it was probably a two-hour trip down, two hours at the match and a two-hour trip back um, pretty much every single Saturday night. And, yes, you were doing it to get a look at your upcoming opposition. You know, any of those three clubs could have been playing against the team you're due to play next week. You were doing it to prepare, but you were also doing it to set standards and to say, these are the lengths I'm going to for you lads. I need you to give it back to me. And obviously, they're aware that you're there. And come Monday morning, when everybody's back in the training or Monday evening, depending on which standard I was at or who I was coaching, you know, what, you know, where have they to hide now? Where have they to hide now? If they've, they've taught themselves, I would rather have done anything on earth on Saturday than what he put himself through. And that's what you want them thinking. That's what you want them knowing, that, that you have put yourself through the ringer on their behalf. Um, the third one, Gary Rogers, he would have been Stephen's goalkeeper at Dundalk. He challenges you to constantly look to improve, he all, you, to always strive to be the best in your position. But, he's all, but he'll also do everything he can to help you achieve that aim. So, I mean, demand, demand, demand. You know, you need to get better. You need to do this. You need to do this. OK, the old phrase, but what have you done for me lately is the one that the player could throw back at you. Now, what I'd preempt there is I'd say to you, like, there's only one of you, and God knows how many of them, there's probably somewhere between 20 and 30 of them, all right? It's mission impossible for you to be thinking about all of those players all of the time. So throw it back in them from the outset. You know, I would always say at that first meeting that we would have at the start of the season, lads, I can't be thinking about all of you all the time. 
So I need you to think about you, and I need you to then hit me with what you need. So in other words, you know, if, if I'm after having a go at you in the dressing room because your crossing was poor in a particular game, I have no problem with you coming back into me at the next training session and saying, well, listen, you haven't actually done anything with me on training over the last month or on, in, on crossing over the last month. You know, what have we done that, that has helped me improve in that area? And that's fair enough for him to question that. Now the ball is back in your court. Now you can say, hmm, you know what? He's right there, actually. I need to start, you know, factoring in some crossing drills or maybe taking him for 10 minutes at the end of a session to work on where and when he should be delivering from. Um, but I, I just thought that was was very, very clever. And, like, that again, that's what Stephen does. Uh, I want you to become the best that you can be. But I'll tell you, I'm going to help you every inch of the way to get there as well So I am. And again, something that we, that we all need to be conscious of, rather than just telling them to get better. Well, what are we? What are you actually doing as a coach to help them get there? Um, I suppose that's the main body from that side of things. Uh, I've got a slide here how we can learn from other sports. So this is is kind of lots of different bits and pieces, lots of different bits and pieces because there's there's formal learning, there's informal learning, there's occasions where we're learning when we when we don't even realise we're learning. Some of it is enjoyable, some of it is not quite as as enjoyable, but I just can't stress enough how much I believe that a day a day where I personally believe a day where I haven't improved a little bit as a coach by picking up something, it could be the smallest of things, is, is a day wasted. And I, I think we have to be constantly on the lookout for where we can pick up new learning from. Um, first one I've thrown up is formal education. So I went back to UCD to do a master's in science in sport um, under Dr. Seamus Kelly. Uh, Seamus Kelly is an absolute gentleman. Um, he was involved in football, soccer at, at a very, very high level, um, both in Ireland and in England. He came back. He was involved with, with uh, Offaly to a very, very high level. Um, and he's now the main man over there in terms of, of coaching science in UCD. He's a brilliant guy to talk to. If you're looking to do something formal like that, get in touch with him. He's on Twitter. His email address is easy enough. Get it as well. They do reserve a certain amount, a certain percentage of places on these courses for people who mightn't necessarily have the previous qualifications that you would normally need to have, but have got, um, or they've got a phrase on it, experiential learning or something like that, that you, you've been, because you've been involved, um, they'll let you come in at a certain level. Um, it, 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 it's really tough. It's really, really time consuming. I, I haven't quite got there yet, to be quite honest about it. Um, but if, if you think it's a place that you're at in your life and you're ready for it, uh, I couldn't recommend that one highly enough. Um, Semi-formal education. So Coaching Ireland, um, Hayley Harrison, it used to be Liam, some people are probably would know Liam Morgan. Hayley Harrison is over there. I think she's still the main person over there now. They've got some brilliant stuff going on over there as well. And I did their tutor, um, Coaching Ireland, the tutor qualification. So you're you're learning to coach coaches. Um, but it, it also learned me a huge, it also taught me a huge amount about my own coaching because it gets you thinking far more about structure, about planning, about reflection. It goes into all of those things massively. Um, I found it really, really beneficial. Even this crack that you've seen me of thrown up at the start, what are the aims? And you'll see me recapping at the end as to whether we hit those aims. That's just ripped off straight from, from something I learned through that course as well. Um, so that's that's definitely something worth, worth looking into, uh, I would say, for, for a lot of people. Um, the next one I've got is the most obvious one of all is, is watch sessions. Look, watch sessions at all sports, all levels. Um, I can't stress that enough. I mean, a couple of points I'd, I'd, I'd make on it are, I've, I've genuinely, I, I've watched an under 10 training session at, at my local club where I thought, yep, make that grid a bit bigger, put one or two more limitations on, on touches and stuff like that. And, and that session actually can be, that, that particular training practice can be completely replicatable with my lads at League of Ireland level. So you don't be, you can't afford to be snobby about where you're trying to get your learning from in terms of, oh, you know, that, that, that level is beneath me, if that makes sense. Um, and then all sports as well, all sports. You know, you could watch a drill where with a hurl, I could watch a, a, hurl, a, a practice with a, a hurl in the state where I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I can actually replicate pretty much that exact same drill just in a football setting with my lads. And you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up so, so easy. I mean, I was, I was incredibly lucky last year where Corrifin footballers, I mean, an incredible group of players, 
um, where their management team approached me and asked me to come in and do a couple of sessions for them. Um, I suppose they're training all year round. They're training so much that they just wanted something a bit different and a bit outside the box. I suppose every football training, Gaelic football training drill that existed, they'd already done it. And they asked me to come in. They gave me a brief, the management team gave me a brief outline of the kind of stuff that they'd like me to cover. They felt that there was a couple of concepts that were prominent in soccer that maybe quite weren't quite as worked on in Gaelic football. And they gave me those concepts and then said, right, now off you go, develop a couple of drills based on those concepts for us. <laughs> they were very clear in that. He said, I don't want you going Googling Gaelic football drills because that's pointless to us. We've done all them. I need you to invent something new. And it was very, very challenging for me to come up with something like that. But I love doing it. They seemed to enjoy it. And the feedback was that they took a, a little something from it. I'm sure it was only a little something, but they took something from it. So, you know, I just can't emphasize enough what, what can be picked up from, from dabbling across other sports. Um, integrate other sports coaches into your own coaching setup. So as I've said to you already, Jason Ryan was phenomenal for me down at Wexford. Absolutely phenomenal. I, I said to him when I brought him in, right, strength and conditioning is going to be your main base here for me, but Jason, I want you to assess everything we're doing. Um, I'd heard such great things about him and, and how structured he was and how good his communication styles were and all that. I said, I want you to critique everything that we're doing. I said, I'll have a tick neck. I won't fall out with you. I'm not looking for the good things that we do. I want to know where we're doing things poorly or where you believe we could do things better and I need you to hit me with that. And he was he was brilliant at it, brilliant at it. He was he, he didn't hold back, I'll tell you that. And I did need to take neck at times, but it, it was absolutely invaluable. It really, really was. I also brought Johnny O'Connor, the former Irish Rugby International, in as my strength and conditioning coach when I was at Galway. Again, partly because he'd be good at the role, but partly because I wanted a different set of eyes. I wanted somebody who was used to a different culture, used to a different setup, and could offer us things from a different angle. I mean, I suppose the example would be performance analysis. Like, Johnny couldn't wrap his head around how our performance analysis sessions were kind of 20, 25 minutes max. Um, he was used to in a rugby setting where they were, they'd go an hour to an hour and a half. You know, it was just interesting to have that conversation with him and bounce those kind of stuff off him. Um, you know, if you're a Gaelic football coach, is there a basketball coach close to you? Is there a basketball coach in your town or that? Can you can you go and have a chat with him and, and maybe invite him in and, and see would he be interested in taking a session for you? You know, just think outside the box a little bit. I, I really would encourage it. Um, books, I've just thrown up a few. I've tried to steer away from, from GEA ones, really, because um, you're probably all well acquainted with them. So I've thrown up there. Quiet Leadership is Carlo Angelotti. I think he's brilliant. He's got this section at the end of each chapter where he, he points out the learnings from each chapter. Um, so it makes it really, really easy to recap. It's really, really excellent. And he's a guy whose style of management I would kind of align myself to, to a certain extent. Um, Brave New World is Mauricio Pochettino. Again, a guy who, who I think is, was, did a fantastic job and is he, really open in the book. Really, really open in the book. Um, I remember reading it and he, he talks about the, the 20 minutes where the players are outside warming up. Um, where he has nothing to do has been his worst 20 minutes of the week. And I thought, oh, you talk about hitting the nail on the head. I thought it was brilliant. It was exactly exactly how I felt myself. Um, but look, there's loads and loads of gold in that. Um, Sacred Hoops is probably back in, in, in vogue at the moment, I suppose, to a certain extent with, with, with uh, the Chicago Bulls documentary having come out on, on Netflix. Sacred Hoops is, is donkey's years old. It's, it's Phil Jackson's book. Um, I would have picked it up maybe 15 years ago. Um, but it's it's again it's excellent in terms of taking learnings from from a different sport and from a very very different culture as far as American sport. Um, I found it really really excellent. The only GEA one I've thrown in there is because it's it kind of went under the radar when it came out years back. It was called Can You Manage? I think the guy's name was Tim Healy. Um, it's literally a, a playbook for GEA management. Like it goes through absolutely everything, the ins and outs, and be it club or county or college, whoever you're managing. Um, it's really I found it very very good can be quite hard to get, get, but maybe give it a Google and, and you might find it somewhere. And Bounce, uh, one of the best, one of the first books, I suppose, I read in terms of talent development. I thought it was absolutely excellent at the time and, and still worth getting your hands on, if, certainly if you haven't already read it. Um, newspaper articles, look, it's it's an absolute one-stop shop here for you. Um, Brian McDonnell, uh, fantastic guy. His Twitter feed is at 6242. Brian is... Just the level of reading the man gets through is absolutely ridiculous, so it is. And if there is a coaching article out there in the world that's worth reading, he'll have it read. 
and retweeted on that Twitter account by the end of the day. So I would certainly imagine the vast majority of you are already following that Twitter account. But if you're not, you need to get onto it straight away. It's 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 a fantastic resource. Um, and yeah, any of the, the you look, just read all those articles as much as you can. You'll pick up stuff from it all the time. Um, podcasts. Here's the shameless the shameless plug on my behalf. So I just started a new podcast uh, last week for the 42.ie called How to Win at Dominoes. It's a, a podcast for coaches. Um, we've managed to get some fantastic access on it so far. It's basically it's an hour long chat with a coach in, at some level of some sport. Um, trying to pick their brains and learn from them as much as possible. We had the amazing Gary Keegan as our first guest last week, uh, had Cheddar Plunkett this week. And over the coming weeks, uh, we have Parik Harrington, we have Billy Walsh, we have Stuart Lancaster, um, Eamon O'Shea, some really, really good guys coming up. So there's my, my uh, as I say, my shameless plug out of the way. Aside from that one, um, the High Performance Podcast is a new enough one, really, really good. Recent guests they've had on it were Robin Van Persie was really good this week. Really, really good. A um, couple of weeks ago, uh, they had Mauricio Pochettino. I've already spoken about it with the book. Again, very, very good. So he was re- some some excellent learning to be got from it. The coaching bubble, it's very similar to the podcast that I'm doing myself with the party too. Very, some really good guests on it so far. Um, definitely worth getting a look at. The locker room is Kieran Dealey's one. Very, very good. I think he's only two episodes done so far, but I found them both very, very informative. He's, he's always a good guy to listen to. Uh, the GEA hour, I'm well aware that Woolley is not everybody's cup of tea, um, so he's not, but I think he's excellent. I think his line of questioning with the guests he has on means that he, he gets some real, real good stuff out of them all the time. And uh, again, speaking of Cheddar, you know, he gets Cheddar on fairly regularly. And, you know, when, when Cheddar starts talking about hurling and tactics and coaching and man management and all that. It's 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 like going to Mass and listen to a sermon. He's, he's that good. He's phenomenal. Um, the Flying Coach is a very new one. Uh, I think the first episode only came out last week. Believe it or not, the two probably the two high, top coaches in America, uh, Steve Kerr, who clip unfortunately wouldn't play for me when I tried to play it for you. Um, Steve Kerr um, and Pete Carroll. So you're talking about American football and, and basketball, two of the, the top coaches. First episode was outstanding. I've just downloaded the second one today. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but the first episode was absolutely fantastic. Definitely worth listening if you can get to that. Um, this is a new one for me, webinars. I didn't know what a webinar was a month ago. Um, and now we're in a whole different world, aren't we? Um, look, obviously you're on this one. The GA Learning Portal one has been fantastic. I just can't praise it enough. It's been brilliant and, and long may it continue. I hope they're, they stay rolling out the guests for as long as this situation continues. Uh, the FEI Coach Education Department have started um, to roll a couple out. I think there's there's one on very shortly, and I think they're going to make it a weekly event as well. So again, you know, whether you're into soccer or not into soccer, it might be worth having a look to see what you can learn from there. The North American Irish soccer coaches, they've done some really, really good ones of late. They had one with Martin O'Neill um, recently. They had one with Andy Reid. And tomorrow they have Jim McGuinness, um, which should be very, very interesting indeed. Um, so worth, worth having a look there. Stat sports, I'm into all that side of things um, as well. The sciencey side of things, um, they've done a couple recently. Damien Young was on one and they had a guy from, from Arsenal. They were very, very, very good. Uh, sporting champions, again, they've, they've had some excellent ones so far, worth getting a look at. And a new one up one to me there was the fo- uh, Foundation Coach Education, if you stick it into Twitter or stick it in online. They actually had... Um, Steve McLaren just this afternoon, uh, so they had. So look, these things have, have taken off massively. They've exploded really, so they have, and they're, they're brilliant. That while we're all in, in lockdown, we're still able to pick up our, our bits and bobs of learning. And I suppose the last two that I'd finish off that are a bit different to the rest, um, you know, a mentor. Can you try and get yourself a mentor somewhere? And mentor is probably even a bit too formal of a word. Just is there somebody out there that you can bounce ideas off or you know when you're when you're getting it tougher when things aren't going quite right for you is there is there a person that you can give a, a call to that you can throw a few things at and get their opinion on it and and know that that you can be completely open with them and I, I've got that um and I, I find it incredibly incredibly valuable and maybe it doesn't even have to be that formal I mean it doesn't even have to be a mentor as in somebody who's you know been to the top of the game and back yeah that can be handy I mean you know, there's the phrase, you learn from your mistakes. Well, it's a hell of a lot better if you can learn from another person's mistakes. Let them tell you about the mistakes they've made and, and learn that way. Um, but also just just peers, just talking to peers as much as you can. And again, go outside your own sport. Um, 
I had a chat with Christy O'Connor there recently where he was talking about stuff that he was, you know, he was he was doing and, you know, talk about car curlers and, and bits and bobs they were doing. And as he was talking, I was thinking, Jesus, that makes sense. You know, I could definitely do that within our own setup. Um, so look, try and, and, you know, be the mentor, be it just other peers, try and surround yourself and make sure you're having those conversations as often as possible. And that kind of feeds into the last one. And I'm, I'm just about done, folks. That feeds into the last one, which is networking groups for sharing content. You know, they're so easy nowadays, obviously, with WhatsApp. But I'm on a, a, a GAA performance analysis WhatsApp group that there's just fantastic stuff in, um, really, really is. And that kind of prompted me to set up my own one just for coaching in general. I set up one a couple of months back, and I, I think we're up to maybe 60, 70 people in it at the moment. And some of the stuff that's going up there and uh, almost nothing that's up there anymore goes up from myself. It, it's just all the other coaches that I've added to it as we're going along. Um, Bernard Jackman has been a recent recruit into it. And I'll tell you, he's, he's the star pupil in the class. He's been fantastic in terms of the content that he's been throwing up there. Some really, really top level stuff. Um, if anybody wants to get into that coaching group, lads, it's completely and utterly open to everybody. Um, my Twitter feed is on the bottom here. My email address is, is on the bottom here. Um, look, fire me a direct tweet or an email or whatever the handiest way for you is to contact me and just, just give me your name and, and your number. I'll add you into that WhatsApp group. But uh, I suppose the rule in the group is don't be joining unless you're prepared to share as well. Um, so look, that's that's been been very, very helpful. So wrapping it up, I suppose, like I said, going back to the, the desired outcomes from the start of the presentation, explain why I think it's important to look for learning from outside your own sport. I, I really hope I've, I've hammered that home. Um, present some of the knowledge that I've picked up from studying how soccer's top managers go about creating their desired culture. Obviously, we focused on those four particular teams, and I hope they made sense, and I hope they, they, you, there might have been some stuff in there that you do think is applicable to your, to your own stuff. Um, and highlight some of the avenues available for continued learning outside of those provided by the GEA. Obviously, you've got your, your, your uh, foundation and level one and, and level two, but you know, for a lot of people, they want more than that. They want more than that. And they want stuff they can access every single day. And, and I suppose that's what I was trying to do with that last slide. So um, that is me done and dusted. Um, Peter, I'm hoping you're still alive on the other side of that screen there. Still here, Shane, yep. Um, look, um, don't know if, if what way you've structured it. If, if, if there is any questions or if I'm, I'm done and dusted, you tell me. Yeah, no, we've time for a couple of questions, if that's all right with you. No problem at all, yeah, no problem. Um, I appreciate. First of all, thanks very much for putting the effort into that. I know Shane is one of these people who still has the opportunity to go into the office, and he hasn't gone home yet today, so we, we won't keep you too long. Um, a couple of questions that came through from from people. You've spoken a lot about about um, about uh, culture and your and, and philosophy and things like that. Can you maybe describe your own coaching style or coaching philosophy and, and what you try to to bring from a culture perspective? Yeah, look. I suppose the first thing I'd say is there is no right and wrong in terms of style. I mean, that's that's for sure. I think we're all aware of that by this stage. Um, I, I suppose naturally enough, because I, I, I'd be a younger coach, I would have got into coaching quite young. My style would be of that newer thing of really, really trying to get emp empower the players and trying to get the players buy in and, and and trying to get them on side rather than telling them that they have to be on side or trying to get them to, to, to do things because they believe it's the right thing to do rather than because they're being roared and shouted at to do it. Um look it's 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 a fine line to walk because you're trying to as I say you're trying to get the balance right between seeing that you're giving them a voice without without looking weak you know you do have to be conscious that some people certainly the older style people can see that as well you know why is he asking us for why is he asking us for our opinion in terms of the game plan is he not supposed to be the main man here is he not supposed to be the man with all the answers now i do think modern player is definitely coming around more to the way of of wanting to be given an opportunity to give input and and have a couple of tactical suggestions and be able to ask why I mean, you know, there are still managers out there who see a why as an absolute no-no. I mean, I, I don't, I, I like a why. A why is challenging, don't get me wrong. It is challenging at times. You mightn't have the right answer from straight away on the spot, but that would be my style. And as I say, that's not to say that that's the right style. I mean, you know, based on, based on a lot of the newer stuff, I mean, sure, Brian Cody should be gone about 10 years ago, so he could. I mean, his, you know, his, his stuff, flies in, in the face of an awful lot of what we're being told now is the right way to go about it. But there is no right, you know, it's it's just different strokes for different folks. And, and by the way, obviously, 
your own personality will feed massively into your into your coaching style. You know, I could never I could never coach like Brian Cody because I'm not I'm not as comfortable, I suppose, with, with confrontation maybe, or I'm not as comfortable as I'm not as comfortable in, as comfortable being standoffish. I'm 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 a sociable sort of creature by nature and I like having a bit of crack and that's so why I, I, I could never replicate his style even if I wanted to, you know. So it's it's different strokes for different folks. Um, maybe just one last question because we're 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 out of time, but you you mentioned observing and maybe stealing might be too hard, stronger phrase, but but taking things from from other coaches and so on. What would you say is the number one thing that you saw someone else doing or saying or being, and and you tried to bring in for yourself? Oh, there you are. Um, I would nearly say again. I'd probably go back to. The, I, I like the idea of talking to people who have worked under coaches and basically just saying, what is it that he does well? What is it that he does well? And I, I suppose from that respect, being a leash man and, and being reasonably close with some of the players that are, are, are in, uh, would have been in the leash setup underneath Cheddar, you know, asking them, how is he talking to you? What is he saying to you? You know, them telling me, like I was, oh, there's mad stories and I don't want to be speaking out of school too much or anything, but like, like you know, there was a player who, he was up in Dublin and, and had a college exam and, and, you know, Cheddar wanted everybody down for a training session by a certain time and, you know, this guy was going to get caught. There was no trains that were going to be there in time to have him get him down and the whole lot. Like, he got a text message from Cheddar saying that his, his niece was working in Dublin and was about to leave shortly and she would be outside the college gates at such and such a time. She'd pick him up and she'd have him down there. I mean, I was like, holy God, that is going to the ends of the earth to make sure that your players are satisfied. And you constantly hear stuff from them about he would be helping them in terms of choosing the right college, helping them helping them maybe get through one or two exams in college, um, you know, helping them get a job, you know, all these different kinds of things where he was, he was one for looking at all aspects of, of a player's life rather than just what they were doing over the course of 70 minutes for them on the field. And, and I really tried, tried to take that on board and try to incorporate that into how I dealt with players, I suppose. Here. Thanks very much, Shane. Um, Cheddar is a good role model to have, no doubt about that. Um, so on behalf of everyone, I wanted to say again, thanks to Shane for everything you've done in the last while for this. Uh, since we met up first about uh, six months ago or so at this stage, you, you've, you've given me an awful lot to think about from a, from a coaching perspective. And as some of the people mentioned here on the chat, the passion that you have was nearly coming through the screen to us here and um, all, all around the country. Um, for everyone on the call, just be aware for yourselves. Tonight we passed five and a half thousand people having take, taken part in these webinars. So uh, up to after last Tuesday night, it was 4,900, but 650 odd people tonight brings us to five and a half thousand people in the last month or so taking part in these webinars. So thanks very much for everyone taking part. A sincere thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we have, we share the presentation and the resources and suggested readings and all those things that Shane has on the GA Learning website as well. Um, it'll, it'll all be up there it's, uh, from tomorrow. Next Tuesday, we have Professor Wade Gilbert from Fresno, or California State University in Fresno, who's going to deliver a session. It's going to be 7.30 p.m. for us. It's going to be 11.30 a.m. for him. Uh, but he he spoke at our Games Development Conference in 2017, and he's been a constant, I suppose, source of advice since then. So Wade is going to do a, a presentation for us on Tuesday night next. So the registration for that is open, and the question question options are open there as well. Anyone has a question for, for Wade. So thanks very much to everyone for coming on the call. Uh, I wish you all a good weekend and hopefully we'll see you all again here next Tuesday evening. Thanks very much. Goodbye.